Hey, Fizz One Kids, Campbell here. In our last unit, we talked about velocity and acceleration. And in this unit, we're going to talk about what causes an object to accelerate or why does one maintain constant velocity. So let's take a look. Here is a car that's at rest. I'm going to give it some velocity, right? And so it accelerates. And then it hits that one, it slows down, so it must accelerate again. And the other one took off, right? And then it stopped. So there was sequences there of acceleration, constant velocity, acceleration, but in the negative direction um, for that first car. And so what causes this is interactions with other objects, right? When I interact with the car, the car started to accelerate. When it interacted with the other car, it started to accelerate in the negative direction and slow down. These are called forces. So these interactions are called forces. Now, forces don't just have to be contact. So a contact force is like a push or a pull. Like I pushed on the car and then it collided with the other car, right? Those are contact because there's actually touching. But there are other forces that are non-contact forces. For example, magnets, right? You can have a magnet and you can kind of push or, or uh, pull a magnet uh, with another magnet without it ever touching. Or the earth is a great example of a non-contact force, right? The earth, no matter what you do, you throw a ball, it comes down to the earth. You jump, you come down to the earth. It's not like the earth goes up and reaches and grabs you and pulls you back down, right? It's, it's a non-contact force. It'd be kind of weird if the earth did have little hands. Hmm. Forces are vectors, just like acceleration and velocity and displacement. So it has a magnitude and a direction. So an amount and a direction of the force. So we will also represent it with arrows. The unit of force is called the Newton, named after Sir Isaac Newton. When we draw diagrams of forces, it's like, you know, when we did motion diagrams and we had little arrows for the velocity and acceleration, we do the same thing for forces, but we call these free body diagrams, or I like to abbreviate them FBD. Or free body diagrams are also called force diagrams because what they do is they represent the object as a dot or a box and the forces as arrows. So it's a very generic picture of what's happening with an object. Now, when you're studying forces, you want to choose the object of interest, but we call that the system. So the system is an object or it could be a group of objects that consists of uh, whatever we're studying. Um, the environment is the stuff that is outside of our system, so it's not the object itself, but are the things that interact with the object. So for example, I have a girl here holding a bowling ball and a volleyball. If I wanna study the forces exerted on the bowling ball, then the, my system would be the bowling ball. If I want to study the forces on the volleyball, then my system would be the volleyball. So it's just a fancy way of saying object. And then all the other forces, like her touching the balls with her hands, um, the interaction with the earth, those would be in the environment, they're external forces that are interacting with it. But I could also call her the system and then the bowling ball and the volleyball are part of her system. So then her forces would be her interaction with the floor, which is pushing up on her, and her force of gravity that's pulling her down. So a system is just a fancy way of saying the object that we're interested in. When we draw a system, we represent it simply as a dot or box. I don't know why the box is, high, is in bold here, but either one. Um, you'll see here, I represented the bowling ball as a dot and the same with the volleyball, which makes sense because they're little circles. Um, always draw your force arrows away from the dot or box with a length that reflects the magnitude of the force. So if we take a look at the bowling ball here, you can see here's the force of her hand on the ball, right? She's holding the ball. That's an interaction, a touching force. Um, we're going to have another name for that force in a bit, but right now we'll call it hand on ball. And the force down here is actually due to the earth, right? The force of gravity pulling on the ball down. And so here we're going to call it the force of earth on ball. But again, we're going to simplify those terms in a little bit. Um, here's the forces on the volleyball, the hand and the earth. Why are they smaller in magnitude than the bowling ball? Well, if you've ever hold a, held a bowling ball and a volleyball, you know that the volleyball is a lot lighter, so she doesn't have to exert as much force to hold it up. So again, the vectors, the arrows are the force vectors. They show the magnitude, so how big the force is, and the direction.
Here's just a catalog of forces. We're going to go through some of these in a little bit more detail in a, in a second. Um, but one that I won't talk about, which, you know, if I push on the car uh, or the car collides with the other car, we would call that like a pushing force. So we might label it F sub P. Um, you'll notice that all of these have the little arrows over the top because forces are vectors and they should have the vector notation. Um, force of gravity here, that's the force of the earth on objects, like the force of the earth on that bowling ball. Um, we're going to symbolize it by an F sub G, but you could also symbolize it by a W because it's actually also called weight. Um, here's a couple other forces we're going to talk about, spring force, tension force, the normal force, huh? What's that? It's symbolized in a couple different ways. Your book symbolizes like this. I've never done that before. I always do F sub N. There's frictional forces. There's a drag force. And then uh, we'll do a little bit with electric forces in second semester, but we will not talk about magnetic forces. That's really a topic of AP Physics 2. So let's go through some of these forces. Um, force of gravity. Now, of course, forces are vectors, so you'll see I don't frequently put the little arrow vector symbol on top, but if we want to be technically correct, we should do that. Um, you'll see me symbolized by the force of gravity as an F sub G. This is due to the interaction with the Earth. It's the Earth's gravitational pull on an object, and it acts on every object that has mass, which means pretty much every single free body diagram you're going to draw in this class will have a force of gravity on it. There's a way to calculate the force of gravity, and it's by taking the mass of an object and multiplying it by the acceleration due to gravity on that planet. So if you remember in our last unit, we talked about the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. But on other planets, it has other magnitudes. This force of gravity, like I said, is also called weight. So when you actually weigh yourself on a scale, you're actually getting your force of gravity, or your weight. You're not getting your mass, because mass and weight are not the same thing. Mass is the total molecules that make up your body. It's all your protons and neutrons and electrons. That's the mass of an object. But the weight of an object comes from how hard uh, whatever planet this object's on is pulling down on it. Um, the vector always points straight down uh, in the case when we're talking on Earth, because that's where most of our problems will be done, um, will be towards the center of the Earth. No matter how it's moving, the force of gravity is always straight down. So every free body diagram you draw should have a force of gravity on it, and it should point straight down. So here's an example. When I ask you to calculate the weight of an object or the force of gravity on the object, you just take the mass of the object and you multiply by the acceleration due to gravity. So I have to tell you where to calculate the weight. In this case, on Earth, we would just multiply these together and we would get 98 newtons. You'll notice that a newton is equivalent to a kilogram meter over second squared. Hmm, interesting. Would the weight of this block be the same on the moon? No because the acceleration due to gravity is different. But what about the mass? Would the mass be the same on the moon? Yes, because the mass is the composition of all the matter in the molecule uh, or in the object or the system or whatever. Um, by the way, I'll ask you this other times because it's a great trick question. Um, another type of force is a spring force. Spring forces can actually push or pull. So I have a little turtle here that I got out of my son's room, and it has a little head that's on a spring. There's actually a spring up here on the top of the head. And so when I push on that, right, it oscillates back and forth because a spring can push or pull. Now, if we stretch a spring, it exerts a pulling force, and if we compress a spring, it's going to exert a pushing force. So spring forces vary. The direction is not set. It depends upon where it is from what I like to call its rest position, which is technically called the equilibrium position. So here I took the spring out of my pen, uh, and right now it's in its equilibrium position. This is where it would be if there are no forces uh, pushing or pulling on it. If I pull on it, right, I've stretched it past that equilibrium position. That's where the end is. And you'll see if I let go, right, it's going to pull it back in. And in fact, I can feel it pulling on my finger. So it's stretched. And so the force of the spring is in the direction back towards this equilibrium position. But if I stretch this, or sorry, if I compress the spring, right, when I let go, it pushes it out. 
And that's because the force of the spring is trying to push it back to its equilibrium position. So you'll notice that if it's stretched, the force points back towards where it would be at rest. And if it's compressed, it points to the right here in this case, back to uh, where it wants to be when it's at rest. So all objects want to be at rest, even you. Um, so even when you go running, you have to stop eventually. That's why we all go to sleep at night. You know, we all want to be in our equilibrium position. There is an equation for a force on a spring. Oops, wrong way. The force on a spring equation um, is K delta X. Now this K we'll talk about when we talk more about springs later, but it is called the spring constant. The spring constant is about basically how stiff or how stretchy a spring is. So this spring right here, this pen one is actually pretty stiff. It's a pretty stiff spring. When I pull on it, it takes a lot of force to pull on it. Um, but a slinky, a slinky has a very low spring constant. It's very easy to push and pull on. This delta X here refers to how far that spring is stretched or compressed from its equilibrium position, from its rest position. So that's the equation for a spring force. There's also a tension force. Tension forces are different from spring forces. Um, they usually come from ropes. Um, and it's due, and so here is uh, my lanyard. It's exerting a tension force uh, here on my keys. But tension force is only a pulling force. I can only use this to pull on my keys. I can't use it to push on my keys. So a tension force is different from a spring force because it can only pull. Because of that, its vector always points away from the object um, and on the, on the line of whatever the rope is. So here is a picture of the tension force exerted uh, on this these weights. This guy is pulling this rope that's exerting a tension force on the weights that he's pulling. Normal force, what the heck is a normal force? Well, remember in our little picture with the girl hang holding on to the bowling ball and the volleyball, we had the force of the hand on the ball, H on B. Um, we're gonna call that the normal force. So what the normal force is, is just a force that's exerted by the surface on an object. So you're probably sitting in a chair right now, maybe, and you can feel the chair pushing up on you. So we're not gonna call that the force of the chair on you which you could, we're gonna call it a normal force because F sub N is a lot cleaner than F of C on Y. Um, so we're gonna call it the normal force, but it's due to a surface. If there's no surface interacting with the object, then there is no normal force. Um, the vector is always perpendicular to the surface and it'll always point away from the surface. So even if you are on an angle, notice this is a perpendicular line uh, to the surface. So here's a, an example of a part of a free body diagram that's a box. And here the, it's, the surface is flat, right? That's the surface this box is sitting on. And so it points perpendicular to the surface, away from the surface. If we put it on an incline, it's still perpendicular to the surface. But it comes from the fact that the surface is pushing up. If we did a free body diagram and we on the girl holding the balls, and we called the system the girl holding the balls, the normal force would actually be the force of the floor on her. Um, so the, cause she's standing on the floor, which is a surface. The force of friction is something we're gonna spend a whole nother video on, but it is also a force that's exerted by a surface. It is always parallel to that surface. And the, there are two types. There's static friction, which is a force that keeps an object I like to call it, stuck to the surface. Um, so it points in a direction to prevent motion. And so, and it's a balancing force, so it doesn't really have a specific equation. There's an equation for like the maximum static frictional force before you start to move it. But again, we'll talk in more detail about friction later. Kinetic friction is once we start moving an object along a surface, right, there's rubbing going on. And so that rubbing causes this friction. And it always, kinetic friction always opposes the motion. So if the object is moving in one direction, then the force of kinetic friction will be in the opposite direction. The kinetic frictional force does have an equation. It's mu sub k times fn, which you can write down for now, but like I said, we're gonna spend a whole nother video on that. So I'm not gonna go into detail on it now. Here's an example. Here's uh, where I have kinetic friction. I have a sled that's moving to the right with some speed. And because it's moving, there's kinetic friction. And that friction is opposing motion, so that's why it's to the left. 
Here, uh, this lady is pulling on this box for some unknown reason, All right? The box isn't moving. She's pulling uh, to the left. And so the static friction is to the right. It's like the balancing force that keeps it from moving. Static friction is a little trickier. And so, like I said, we're going to have a whole nother video.